Before we kick off the show, if you're a fan of History Hack, please do what you can to support the show. We completely get that not everyone is able or willing to dig into their pockets. Times are hard, but by dropping a like, subscribing on Twitter and YouTube, and importantly, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, you can help the program grow and reach more people. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, go to patreon.com forward slash history hack, where you'll find perks from secret Facebook groups to early release material. If you just want to leave us a one-off tip, go to co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description. And whatever form your kind support takes, know that we are massively grateful. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to History Hack. Zach and I are very excited today because we have a very topical subject to discuss, one that will bring up some emotions and hopefully some enlightening conversation. So Zach, who do we have with us today? Well, I've done my thing when I want to bring you an absolute pearl and raided the sort of historical chocolate box that is the University of Southampton History Department. Not that I'm in any way biased being from Southampton myself. So I've gone and got you Dr. Chris Fuller, who is an Associate Professor of Modern and Contemporary US Foreign Policy at the University of Southampton. He's the author of a fantastic book called See It, Shoot It, The Secret History of the CIA's Lethal Drone Programme, which is every bit as cool of a topic as it sounds from a kind of nerdy aviation perspective, but also, as you say, Matt, is hugely topical given recent developments in the news. Chris, it's brilliant to have you on. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for the uh, invitation. And uh, and yes, quite quite right. Very topical uh, subject. So I've been I've been doing my best to avoid getting pinned down in uh, short news interviews, having to try to explain the complexity of, of what's going on uh, in the region around Afghanistan in in you know kind of thirty second sound bites, which is which is not my domain. Uh, so I'm, I'm much more comfortable with this being a, a podcast in which we get to discuss this uh, properly. So thank you for the invitation. Well, we're definitely going to be giving you more than 30 seconds today. That's for sure. <laughs> because, you know, from sort of from, from my from my sort of bent on the Second World War, where we start seeing the UAV to appear in, in different forms to today, where we have drones is completely synonymous. We sort of half expect them to be everywhere and they probably are. But how did we get here and where did this concept first develop? Yeah, well, so, I mean, it's 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 interesting that you you've already kind of identified this idea that as a technology, um, a kind of unmanned aircraft date back much later than a lot of people think. You know, they're, they're dabbling with this technology in the Second World War. Um, from the US perspective, it, it kind of splits into, into two camps, probably. Um, there are those that argue that the modern drone, as we might see it, really has its origins in, in Vietnam. Um, and that essentially what, what drones stand for is this kind of regime of, of hypervisibility that you you have this sense here, this kind of Foucauldian vision of the, the panopticon, if it were, that you know, in order to be able to have power over a body, you need to be able to see it. And the United States problem is that it's uh, confronting opponents that it can't easily see. And in, in the case of Vietnam, it's obviously uh, kind of jungle, um, but also borders, right? Territory that it's not legally meant to be operating in. Um, and so there are those that have identified electronic warfare and uh, the use of uh, aerial assets, unmanned aerial assets flying over Vietnam as the beginning of modern drone warfare. Um, the, another school of thought on this, and, and this is more what I argued in, in the book here, is that actually that's somewhat different. That is a continuation of satellite surveillance and spy planes, and that drones are something different because drones aren't just about identifying and finding targets, but they're about destroying them. Um, and so I would argue that this emerges in the 1980s. It's, it's actually a counterterrorism tool, and it emerges as US policymakers are struggling with um, hostage crisis in Beirut and how to deal with um, terrorist organizations based in places like Libya um, and that hide amongst urban populations. And that's when early ideas about using remotely piloted aircraft starts to emerge. And, and then those two kind of coalesce really around in the 1990s with the Gulf War and the Balkans, when you start to see that combination of overhead surveillance um, and, and the difficulties that, again, as the US leans heavily on air power, um, things like cloud cover, things like your opponents hiding scud launchers under freeway bridges uh, or uh, under camouflage netting, 
or sophisticated anti-aircraft weaponry, meaning you have to be very careful about the risk you, you put pilots in. All of that just kind of pushes towards advancing this remote technology. And it's it's a, um, a natural evolution, really, that it moves from identifying targets to then carrying weapons and, and firing those weapons at those targets. So it's, it's those two threads, really. Um, persistent surveillance and then precision munitions combining through the 1990s so that by the time we get to the war on terror um, this technology has been being honed for 40 years. And the title of your book is really significant in terms of that transitional process isn't it because there is a, a moment where um, senior officials in, in the US government say we need a see it shoot it capability isn't there? Talk us through that that decision making process. Yeah, so that it's a direct quote from an individual uh, called Richard Clark, who was Clinton's uh, counterterrorism advisor. He was the first kind of official counterterrorism individual based in the White House whose responsibility was to uh, combine and to uh, help unite all of the different branches of the US government with a, a kind of counterterrorism focus. Uh, so that, that shows, you know, Clint, the Clinton administration was kind of waking up to this new era um, of terrorism, which the rest of us kind of became aware of um, with 9-11. But, you know, the, the Clinton administration had identified this um, in, the, in the early 1990s and placed this individual, Richard Clark, um, uh, in charge of, of coming up with a solution. Um, and he produced a report in 2000 in which he uh, mentioned the Predator drone, as it was, but at that point, an unarmed reconnaissance um, drone. And he stated that they needed to move forward with developments of arming this drone to give what he then said in the report, a see it, shoot it option, because um, they had on three separate occasions had credible intelligence that they had filmed uh, bin Laden and other senior members of Al Qaeda with a predator drone um, in the Kandahar region of Afghanistan. And, and what Clark was arguing is, well, we've located him, we have found him, we now need to be able to put munitions on that spot. Uh, and the problem was, um, up until that point, that meant firing cruise missiles. And the, the geopolitics of the situation, uh, having to fire missiles over Pakistani airspace at the time when tensions between Pakistan and India um, over potential nuclear exchange were, was so high, it was just incredibly dangerous to, to do that. Um, and you, it would have required alerting the Pakistani officials, which, um, as we now know, with, with quite credible evidence, they were actually quite sympathetic to both the Taliban um, and to some of the members of the jihadi corps. So there was a good chance that they would have tipped those targets off. Um, but also cruise missiles themselves, between prepping them and launching them from um, uh, wherever you might have been, the Red Sea, the um, uh, Indian Ocean, it was, it was going to take hours for them to arrive at that location. Um, and so this was Richard Clark's point, that you needed to be able to see and shoot at the, at the same time. Um, and the, the predator, even though it had this, you know, this kind of aggressive name, um, it was unarmed and it, it didn't have that capability. Um, and of course, as we know, that capability doesn't actually emerge um, until after 9-11, but they are developing it. They're working on it. The Air Force, uh, a group called Big Safari, whose job it is, is to kind of use um, off the shelf technology and try to bodge together technological solutions to these problems. Um, they are developing the armed drone. Um, and actually, it's only three days before 9-11 that uh, George Bush has a meeting uh, which Richard Clark had requested back in January 2001 um, to discuss how they're going to use this weapon and to try to work out the authorizations of who's going to pull the trigger, who's going to pay for it. Um, is it the CIA? Is it the Air Force? Uh, and they don't actually resolve that, that thorny legal issue in that meeting of, of 9th of September. But that, that meeting is a product of this call for a, a kind of see it, shoot it option. And of course, uh, after 9-11, um, the gloves come off, all legal red tape is uh, shredded and the weapon is um, in the air by um, the first night of Operation um, uh, Enduring Freedom, the, the first um, salvo of the war on terror in Afghanistan on the um, uh, 7th of October 2001. So let's get into the details here, because when we say drone, we don't literally mm. mean drone as an auto autonomous thing. We've got a whole sort of ecosystem around it. So let's let's talk about the pilots, because I think that's that's going to be important. In my head, I go straight to Eye in the Sky, the Gavin Hood movie from a few years ago with Aaron Paul, who I thought was brilliant in it. That sort of the pilot going to a shipping container in Arizona and flying a drone tens of thousands of miles away. 
So is is it right that we're sort of saying that the supposed suicide rates are higher among these pilots compared to normal fighter pilots? And is there any say, um, sense in saying that that is true or are we wrong? Yeah, so, so this is kind of alluding to this um, uh, idea of kind of PlayStation warfare that, that emerged. This, as, you know, drone warfare became more broadly known. Um, it was pretty common that critics would refer to this idea that the remoteness is making killing easier and easier. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons that's pretty persistent is that there is a degree of truth to that, in that if we think of the traditional um, bargain that individuals make entering warfare is that there's this sense of reciprocity. It's it's dangerous. Right? And that danger um, is meant to act as something of a control. Um, it, it acts in that you don't you're not supposed to put your military at incredible risk, but it also helps to curtail democratic governments in that um, there should be a cost to using military force. And if you put soldiers' lives at risk and those soldiers die, and we see those coffins coming back, then questions are, are asked. And drones, by having the pilots exactly as you, you mentioned at a, uh, you know, somewhere like Creech Air Force Base in Nevada, they are not subject to reciprocity in the way that even an F-16 pilot over a war zone is. Uh, I mean, you know, that, that American shift towards air power did skew the idea of reciprocity. Um, you know, American uh, airmen have been at considerably less risk of being casualties than, than those on the ground, but that doesn't mean that it was risk-free warfare. Um, you know, soldiers were shot down in the Gulf War, uh, sorry, uh, pilots were shot down in the Gulf War, they were shot down in the Balkans, um, and they have been shot down in, in every um, American air war since, but in, in much smaller numbers. When drones are shot down, however, there is no risk to those uh, pilots. However, that's a, that's a very certain kind of risk, that's a physical risk. So, so what you're alluding to here with, with this idea of suicide rates is actually what the evidence has borne out is that PlayStation warfare is a myth. Um, there might not be the same physical risk to these pilots, but there is definitely a mental health risk. And even though they themselves are remote from the battlefield, um, their brains are fully aware that they are engaged in warfare, that they are engaged in the act of taking lives and that they're witnessing others being killed. Um, so they have similar, or in some cases, uh, certain research shows slightly higher rates of PTSD than soldiers from uh, actively within war zones. And one of the reasons for that is just the, the graphic nature of what they witness. So it's not unusual that a drone pilot might follow a suspected uh, terrorist or an enemy combatant for weeks and gather intelligence on that individual, see their family, see their interactions with friends and their community. Um, and they form uh, quite a kind of close bond to that individual through basically observing their life over these long periods of time. Um, and then they are asked to, to kill these individuals. Not only that, but when they witness the violence, they do it through high resolution cameras. And after the violence of the, the actual missile blast um, or, or whatever munition it is uh, that, they've, that they've dropped, a, a paveway bomb or um, some other form of munition, they for the after action report need to witness the consequences of, of what they have done in a much more graphic sense than um, other individuals involved in air combat who might drop a bomb and be uh, well away from the site by the time that that munition lands. Counting body parts, uh, observing any levels of collateral damage and civilians that might have been harmed in this blast, that's part of their job. Um, and that has had a significant impact. Um, and not only that, but again, we're into a whole new territory of, of what it is like to basically live in these two worlds, that for the first time ever, you have combatants that get up in the morning, might eat breakfast with their children, commute to work, fight in one war zone one day, commute home, then go back and fight in a very different war zone the next week. They might be in Afghanistan one week, Iraq the next, um, and then back home for a parent-teacher meeting that evening. And that, this has had an enormous mental strain upon drone pilots in ways that we're only now just kind of coming to understand and, and coming to terms with. So on, on one hand, while their, their risk of death in warfare is, is at the lowest ever for these pilots, we are only just starting to understand the, the mental cost uh, of this. 
and and one other point that I, I think is always worth mentioning with drones that, that is often overlooked is that the pilots are only one part of this chain. There's a big infrastructure that uh, underwrites drone warfare. You have the ground control stations, yes, but you also need to be able to um, land these drones, arm these drones, they need a lot of maintenance. So you have ground control teams, um, either in the war zones or nearby. Um, and on the ground, you have teams of spotters, you have informants, you have individuals who feed intelligence back into agencies like the CIA. So in the case of the wars and, and the drone strikes in the FATA region, which is, which is what I really focused on, that kind of Afghan-Pakistan border region, um, there were hundreds of volunteers um, and informants that worked for the CIA at great personal risk. You know, many of these individuals would end up being uh, captured by the Taliban, tortured and publicly executed as a way of trying to um, stop the drone campaign. So while American pilots themselves might be well away from the combatants, drone warfare itself is a, a team activity which has people right there on the ground um, running uh, significant risks to feed intelligence into uh, the, the kind of machine. These things are big too, because I saw the Global Hawk at the Evergreen Museum in, in, in Oregon, and it's massive. So we're not talking your, <laughs> your commercial drone that you'll fly around and take pictures of the neighbors with. This thing is, these things are big. Yeah, I mean, the most, the most common that most people have probably seen, and that's certainly responsible for the, the most lethal strikes would, would currently be the, the General Atomics Reaper. And yeah, that's got a wingspan of, of 20, 21 meters. Um, and, and, you know, again, like, like we were kind of saying, it's, it's the drone, but that then of course requires a large runway. They're, they're very fragile. So these things can't just land um, out, in a, out in a desert somewhere. They have a big footprint, you know, for, for a drone, you will have the ground control station and then you need um, proper runways and they need proper hangers and um, uh, places where maintenance can be conducted on them. You know, they, they frequently have maintenance issues. Um, they're, they're high endurance, they stay in the air for a long time, but they also are very prone to um, mechanical failures, to um, uh, freezing up if they fly through uh, cold clouds, um, and they need all sorts of repair. So th there's this kind of interesting um, moment where you, for a while, people were kind of hunting for the wingspan and the um, sight of drones from overhead to try to work out where the drone bases um, actually were. And um, once the, the Sunday Times was able to break a scoop at a time when the Pakistani government was denying any involvement in um, the US drone campaign over its border, it was claiming that these drones were coming from Afghanistan into Pakistani airspace, uh, launching strikes and then heading back. And they, they were partly doing this because the idea of Americans operating in Pakistani territory wasn't very popular with, with large swathes of the Pakistani public. But there was also an emergent Pakistani Taliban, and they were quite worried about retaliation if they were seen as being uh, too complicit. Um, and the Sunday Times broke a story in which um, on uh, aerial photography from Google Earth, that enormous wingspan had been spotted at a Pakistani military airbase, um, uh, showing that, you know, that there was clear uh, cooperation between these. And, and that actually led to this really interesting phase of um, maps being edited and um, censored. So Google Earth and Microsoft Earth having whole sections of the maps um, blacked out. And what's really interesting is since the United States has withdrawn from um, Afghanistan for the first time in, in uh, over a decade, certain areas of the maps have, are back in higher resolution and, and we can see them now, the, the remnants of American bases. Um, so it, it's, they, have a, they have a big footprint um, and, and the wingspan is, is quite noticeable. And so the, the US has gone to great lengths to try to make sure that these bases um, and, and that distinct um, reaper and predator uh, silhouette is, is not visible from satellite photography. So we can't work out uh, where these, these bases are, are, are placed. It's really interesting that you talk about that newspaper scoop and there are all kinds of questions tied up with the ethics of decisions like that and to what extent do scoops like that actually place personnel at greater risk when manning those bases and so on. And those kinds of questions about ethics are actually quite kind of integrally embedded into your work, aren't they, in terms of what material do you use? Um, I know that you initially were going hunting in the CIA archives, and I've heard you tell this story before, so I'm keen for you to share this with our viewers about kind of the person peering over your shoulder as you're trying to kind of sift through this material. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's perhaps not surprising, right? That, that as, as an intelligence agency, the CIA has a um, difficult relationship with, with information and, and the release of that information. Um, although, you know, I, I think it's worth pointing out that as an intelligence agency of a liberal democracy, um, you know, the CIA does release more information than a lot of other intelligence agencies around the world. And it, it does encourage scholars to, to work with it. So there are ways of gaining access to um, information, um, some of which is archival. Um, also online, you know, the CIA provides enormous kind of dumps of, of documentary material online, which can be searched through their electronic reading rooms as well. Um, but the, the thing with this topic is not only is it sensitive in terms of the targeting and the, the kind of legal architecture and regime behind it, um, but also for a historical topic, it's it's very contemporary. And so that automatically leads you into difficulties in terms of, of access for, for no other reason purely than no one has to release these documents for, for decades. You know, if they declare that this document is sensitive, um, then, then those documents aren't available. So yes, it, it, it led to a pretty interesting um, kind of research route where archives maybe formed an initial part, um, but the, the secret to trying to unpick something like this is actually to, you need to kind of join the dots from multiple different sources. And what you find is one source will reveal a small amount of information that perhaps another source doesn't have. So, so one of my first ways into this was actually through uh, the memoirs of an individual named Dwayne Claridge, who um, was a, a, a kind of classic um, CIA operations officer in the 1980s, um, very much a, a figure of, of kind of Reagan's CIA, this idea that Reagan had come along to unleash the CIA, that they'd been kind of shackled by, um, well, by laws, <laughs> and that, that those things had caused a weakness and that they needed to, you know, be less concerned about these things and, and unleash this agency to do things that it used to be able to do back in the good old days before assassination bans and, and whatever else. And, and in his memoirs, Dwayne Claridge kind of revealed, um, he, he's not able to give the name of the program, but he, he was the first place that I read an individual talking about having come up with a system, is the, the phrase he used, um, to kind of try to deliver um, C4 or explosives into um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's tent. To, to try to kill him. And this, this was a kind of remote method he, he referred to. Um, and later in his memoirs, he talks about trying to find the, the hostages in Beirut and talks about using a um, off the shelf um, a model aircraft with, with a heat sensor and a camera attached to it. Um, but he doesn't talk about the name of this program or any of that, because of course, when, when anyone writes memoirs from the CIA, they have to submit that to the CIA information controllers and they redact and uh, edit and remove things from that. But once you know something like that, well, then you can start looking at directories of aircraft. You can start looking at um, budgets and um, what money is spent on various things. And there was in early drone development circles, there was a, a program called the Eagle program, uh, the, the dates of which aligned with the dates that Dwayne Claridge was talking about coming up with these ideas. So once you find a, a, a little thread like that, you can start pulling on it. So. In that instance, I wrote to the CIA and asked them about information to release information on the Eagle program. And that's where you get actually what's quite a good reply. So, so I was told that they could neither confirm nor deny the existence of the Eagle program. Um, and then they, they will give you the specific um, legal reasons that they're not going to provide you with that information. And they, they usually usefully attach a copy of the, uh, the document as well. But the reason that's interesting to a, to a modern or a contemporary historian is uh, you don't need to do that unless those documents are there, but you don't want to release them. Um, you know, if, if there's nothing, they just tell you that there's nothing. So what it lets you know is that you're onto something, but you're going to have to find alternative routes. Um, and in this case, it was about the um, the actual companies that developed these and the engineers that, that worked on them. Um, you know, I was able to kind of work backwards from um, early drone development and to find out, well, who, who built the Eagle program and... Um, who were they employed by? Who bought the rights to this? Um, and surprisingly, General Atomics, who, who are currently the developers of um, most of these, the, the Reaper drone, as I've already mentioned, for example, um, they are the company that made the Predator drone. So a big, 
key component of the, the current US um, military industrial complex, they were surprisingly open in terms of providing information and dates um, and names of individuals that I could kind of follow up with. So you, you just have to remain open-minded and flexible. You have to think you can't find things in traditional archives. You know, the, the Clinton archive had lots and lots of redacted documents, lots of removed documents. Um, obviously the CIA redacts and removes material as well. Uh, there's a hidden hand of the archivist. There's things that you just don't even know if they were ever removed in the first place. But if you're willing to look at alternative routes, um, and often, you know, when it comes to um, armament industries, um, it's looking at um, patents, it's looking at uh, employment records, it's finding specific engineers who are willing to talk about their, their work, uh, possibly off the record and anonymously, but um, those are ways in. And, and it's, it's a way around the traditional archival approach. And what it means is historians can write about things that are much closer to our, to our dates and to our kind of contemporary events than, than I think a lot of scholars necessarily think. You know, there's a sense that you need to wait 30, 40, 50 years. This will eventually come out. Um, and that's not really the case uh, if you're willing to be a bit flexible. The, the last source of information uh, I'd mention along these lines, and this, this brings it right back to your point about kind of some of the ethical questions, um, is also leaked material. Uh, we, you know, leaks have been a part of, of US foreign policy for as long as there have been secrets, um, but we we live in an age where leaks are no longer, you know, a something the size of the Pentagon Papers, but where actually leaks can now be uh, millions of documents from, from the US State Department or the entire uh, Afghan or Iraq war logs. And they were incredibly useful. They did raise all sorts of questions about the willingness to use this material. Um, Technically, it's, it's illegally released. Um, if you speak to members of the US government, they are not supposed to read these. They're not supposed to have them on their computer. They deny knowledge of them. So, um, you know, I've spoken to members of the CIA at a, at, a, at a conference and had awkward conversations where we have had access to documents right there. And they have to deny that that document is even in, in public circulation because technically it was illegally released. But um, once it is in the public domain, our job as historians is to is to use all available information. Um, and what I always figured is if something I found in research revealed the location of something or the name of an individual that worked on something, then if I could find it, others can find it. And it was worth making people aware that that information is, is now available. So, um, you know, I've given papers before where I've shown what we can find about drone networks on maps and, and what we can't. Um, and rather than thinking that I'm revealing potential attack sites or, or you know, identifying companies involved in drone development, um, this is just highlighting, um, look, this information is out there and you might want to think carefully about whether this location needs more security or whether it needs to be uh, moved elsewhere. So I don't, I don't think the burden is on us as historians to have to censor information. Um, once that information circulates in the public, um, as historians, we have a responsibility to use all available material and the best sources we can find. Um, and leaks are, are really useful for that. That's really fascinating. Um, I think we can come, we're going to come back to sort of usage and location and things like that in a minute. But no weapon system comes out of the box fully formed, um, despite what, say, General Atomics and what sort of Grumman would like us to believe a lot of the time. So what about the sort of failed attempts, the, the hiccups along the way, the, the cancelled programs? Because what we see today is the culmination of a, a lot of a lot of hard work and a lot of sort of blind alleys, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, it's it's this sense that, you know, people kind of seem to assume that drones came out of 9-11 happened and then there were drones. And, and you're absolutely right. This, this is a product of decades and decades of development of different kinds of technology. That, that's... You know, a really important thing to, to keep in mind with drones is in, in technological terms, what's kind of referred to as connectivity. So this idea that lots and lots of different technologies reached maturity around about the same time and allowed this to, to work. Um, so, you know, satellite connections and um, high resolution cameras and then precision munitions and laser guided technology. All of these are separate technologies that have all developed for, for different reasons. and um, without certain ones of these, early versions of drone programs just 
just didn't work. So for example, the Pentagon had a program called the Aquila program, um, which its purpose was meant to be to fly overhead and guide artillery bombardments. And they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this program. But essentially two major problems occurred with it. The, the satellite connectivity was not reliable enough um, and the cameras were not um, good enough. They didn't have, they didn't have the, um, uh, the kind of zoom capabilities and the, the feed wasn't real time enough. And so uh, that eventually ended up being, being scrapped and actually put the Pentagon off drone technology for, for a long time. Um, it's actually DARPA, um, so the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, which, which is an agency that was set up during the uh, Eisenhower administration after, after Sputnik. And it was originally known as ARPA. The, the defense was added a, a bit later, but um, this agency was set up after Sputnik with the primary purpose to, to stop strategic surprise, to make sure that the United States stays on the cutting edge of technology um, and that it's able to manipulate that technology for its own benefit and, and national security purposes. So, you know, people have written and, and uh, highlighted before, DARPA has been involved in the development of uh, what, what's initially the ARPANET that matures into the internet um, and all sorts of artificial intelligence developments now have come through um, ARPA. And the same happens with drones. Essentially, the, the CIA's early experiment with these, um, these kind of off the shelf, remotely piloted uh, model planes that, that Dwayne Claridge was talking about, that doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't work. The Pentagon's efforts don't work. And it's actually ARPA that comes along and injects money and kind of tries to get private sector investors to um, win these, these uh, big contracts to come up with some sort of remotely piloted high endurance aircraft. So, you know, militarily, the US has given up with this. And, and it's ARPA, um, or DARPA as it becomes known, that steps in and starts throwing out big financial contracts to the private sector to step in and, and come up with these um, tools. Uh, and that's that's how General Atomics ends up creating the, the, the Predator drone. It's, it's ARPA money um, that actually does that. Um, and then arming these things, well, this becomes a whole separate problem um, because what DARPA asks for is a high endurance aircraft. So something that can stay in the air for 16 hours. Um, and what that requires is very lightweight airframe. But launching a missile requires a, a tensile strength that, that doesn't exist if we, what you've essentially built is a glider with a propeller. Um, and so when they're trying to develop this kind of see it, shoot it option as it is, um, again, it's all very off the shelf. It's all very kind of um, uh, bodged together, really. So the, the, the missile they end up using, the Hellfire missile, the reason they choose this is it, it weighs 90 pounds. It's, it's light as far as a missile goes. It's, it's not designed for the purpose of assassinating targets precisely. It's designed for destroying tanks. Um, and it has a price tag that reflects a missile that destroys tanks. And, and you know, this becomes the idea. We, we're going to put one of these on, on bin Laden's head. Um, it's absolutely about just bodging together things that exist. And there's early footage of testing the missiles on the wings of Predator drones on the ground. Um, and as the missile flies off, you can see that the, the, the wings getting damaged um, from the force of the blast. So then they're having to kind of um, essentially make different components and different pieces of technology, none of which were designed to work together, uh, essentially come together. And, and again, this is this big safari unit that uh, is part of the US Air Force. They're just experts in customizing existing technology to try to find clever solutions to, to problems. Um, and that, you know, that's eventually what they're able to do. But alongside the technological challenges there, there's also a whole load of legal challenges and, and problems that they encounter. So, you know, when Richard Clark first talks about this idea, um, he runs into trouble with the US State Department because they turn around and say, well, this looks a bit like a new cruise missile. And we're not allowed to create new cruise missiles because we have a, uh, you know, dating back to the Cold War, they, they have a legal agreement, a treaty with Russia that such weapons won't be created. Because what if you put a, a nuclear warhead on one of these things? Are you essentially in breach of um, uh, non-proliferation agreements that, that might have dated from the Cold War, but are still in place and actually they have to the, the us air force and richard clark himself who was involved in, in negotiating some of those treaties during the cold war have to sit down with state department lawyers 
and they essentially have to come up with new definitions that say, well, no, it's got it's got landing gear. This this isn't a cruise missile um, because it takes off and it lands. So the fact that it comes back means legally it, it's defined differently. And even this idea of who pulls the trigger, again, this, this, this delays the launch of this thing because the CIA is a civilian agency. And um, after you know, a spate of assassinations in the 1950s and into the 1960s, eventually by the 1970s, there's an assassination ban. Members of the CIA are not allowed to be engaged in acts that can be defined as an assassination. And flying over an individual like Osama bin Laden outside of a war zone, a legally declared war zone, and killing him with a missile looks a lot like the CIA assassinating someone. So that there's even, as well as these kind of technological challenges, there are these big legal challenges around how do we define this weapon? And then how do we define legally being able to fire this missile at somebody without it being an act of assassination? And so there's all sorts of legal gymnastics that they have to go through, as well as technological gymnastics that lead to these kind of aborted attempts until eventually, just like the idea of technological connectivity, a whole load of legal definitions and um, requirements come together. And it, it, it's massively aided by the fact that post 9-11, um, people are a little bit less fussy about whether hitting someone like bin Laden with this missile would be illegal or not. You know, it, it kind of makes um, things that were big legal concerns on, you know, the 10th of September 2001 simply vanish overnight. Um, and, and that kind of brings together all of these technological and um, legal uh, issues in, into kind of alignment at the same time. And that brings us on really nicely to another area of, of potential misconception that I'm keen for us to look at, which is about kind of usage over time, how things have changed, because people have ideas about different administrations and, and who was and who wasn't using drones. So talk us through that. OK, so it, because, because of these kind of technical difficulties and, and legal difficulties, ultimately, there is no lethal drone strike under the Clinton administration. Um, and the, the plan, this kind of see it, shoot it plan, rolls from uh, Clinton, so it published under his administration, but then it rolls into the Bush administration. Now, actually, um, again, there's, there's a little bit of a, a misunderstanding about the timescale on this. So drones are used in Afghanistan on the first night of Enduring Freedom. So they're used in, in October. Um, in fact, one of the first targets that they almost kill with the first lethal drone strike is Mullah Omar, the leader of the Taliban. Um, he, he is able to escape because they're trying to show the precision of this technology and they don't want to hit the building that he's in. Um, because they don't know who else is in that building. So they wait for him to be out in a, in a convoy. Uh, but they, they end up hitting the wrong vehicle. And then um, everything goes pretty complicated that night because the drone just is, it's so new in the chain of command that um, Air Force commanders aren't even really sure who's authorizing this thing and, and who's in charge of it. So um, it's used then, but that's within a war zone. They don't start being used in the way that is most controversial and we're most familiar with that kind of over the border strike outside of a war zone um, until five years into the, the Bush administration. Um, and the reason for that is because they're building up, the CIA is busy building up the informant network on the floor, on the ground that, that I've kind of mentioned, and um, what's called counterterrorism pursuit teams. Um, and even at the 9-11 the commission, George Tennant is asked how long before we're in a position to strike back against al-Qaeda. And he says at that time, it's going to take five years. Um, and what you see timescale wise is in the last two years or last 18 months of the Bush administration, those drone strikes outside of war zones start to rack up. So what, what happens is, although they have the technology, they don't have the intelligence. Um, you know, this is part of what um, enhanced interrogation, so torture, as we would, would more accurately refer to it as, this is part of what capturing individuals and sending them to Guantanamo is meant to be all about, trying to get intelligence, trying to feed this kind of machine with the information that can then direct strikes. Gradually, as the NSA gets much better at hoovering up data and they start to adapt drones, so drones themselves can intercept 
communications and can pick up radio chatter and can um, intercept satellite communications. Um, that also starts to feed in, combined with this kind of intelligence assets on the ground, and then you start to see um, these strikes really take place. So although George W. Bush has this technology and it's used in war zones right the way from October 2001, you don't see it used in the traditional uh, targeted killing, um, you know, assassination style until 2007. Um, in the transition from Bush to Obama, um, the, the journalist Bob Woodward reports that George Bush informs Barack Obama that these counterterrorism pursuit teams on the ground are the most vital thing and that without them drones are just flying HD cameras. Um, it kind of tells him, you know, this is one of your biggest assets that you're going to have to use. Now, in his first year, Barack Obama launches more drone strikes than George W. Bush had done in his in his full eight years. Um, and that creates this impression amongst most people that Obama was just kind of drone happy. Um, but actually, it's to do with that intelligence network. He inherits a fully mature killing network. And so he's using it from the first day in office. There's a drone strike on the day of his inauguration, whereas George W. Bush has to wait for that to be developed. What he does do over his presidency is he does introduce more and more guidelines that are designed to limit the amount of collateral damage, to make it harder and harder to authorize drone strikes. Um, and that does bear out statistically. Um, by the latter years of his presidency, there are fewer reported civilian casualties and drone strikes. That doesn't mean that they're eliminated, um, but there are, there are fewer. And so that's a combination. That's a combination of the intelligence getting better, it's a combination of every time they fail and they kill civilians, they, they review what went wrong and new procedures and methods are put in place. And of these new guidelines, because under Obama, drone warfare outside of war zones is a White House job. He authorizes those strikes personally. It's very, very micromanaged and centralized. The big change is when Trump becomes president, it shifts to the Pentagon. And there are critics that turn around and say, well, this is because Trump just didn't want to be involved in the reviewing. But actually, there were lots and lots of people within the military establishment saying it's too politicized. We need quicker authorizations. We need the right to be able to call a drone strike when we need it. And actually, under Trump, it's much more traditional. It, it's a war decision, and it's made by the Pentagon with information from the CIA. So, you know, Trump doesn't make drone strikes. Um, well, there are higher civilian casualties in drone strikes under the Trump administration, and he rolls back a lot of the controls that were introduced by Obama. But what he's doing is he's following a much more traditional military method of authorizing airstrikes. So, you know, Obama was the anomaly there. Obama made it a political procedure, and Trump just put it back to being a military procedure. Um, one of the other reasons you get a lot more civilian casualties under Trump is just the stage of the war on terror that he inherits. So by the time Trump comes in, you're starting to see um, Operation Inherent Resolve, which was the, the, the mission against ISIS in Syria and Iraq. That is coming to the point where the US is supporting Iraqi forces that are now liberating cities like Mosul. And that involved a lot of close air support. And essentially what the US said is, the Iraqis are putting the soldiers on the ground at great risk and we will provide the air support that they request. And that air support is in built up urban areas and it's much higher risk of civilian casualties. So if you just look at it statistically, it looks like under Trump that they just didn't take as much care and the Pentagon killed a lot more civilians. And there's, there's a small amount of truth to that in that, um, yeah, they, they're, they're authorizing strikes under laws of war instead of political instruction, but it's also the stage that the conflicts were at. And had Obama been president when Mosul was being liberated, um, you would have also seen civilian casualties because of the nature of the, the kind of warfare they were involved in. Um, where we're at now with Biden, um, there was a moratorium on strikes for a while and they were being reviewed. It was much more likely that it would centralize back to the White House. Um, but the one example we have to, to really fall back on was the strike in Kabul shortly before the um, US withdrew and following the um, ISK um, suicide bombing. And that essentially broke all of the rules. That strike was like going right the way back to the earliest days under um, George W. Bush. 
every procedure, everything that had been put in place appears to have been ignored in a, in a kind of last minute panic. The location of the strike, the intelligence behind the strike, the care taken to avoid civilian casualties, none of those criteria appear to have been met in a, in a kind of knee jerk last minute panic. But it's, and, and you know that that is a it's a tragic strike. It's an awful drone strike, but it is not reflective of of where the Biden administration is likely to go with with drone warfare. It's very much reflective of that moment in time and the, the kind of chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan. It, it doesn't reflect drone use by this administration in any other place in the world. I think that leads us perfectly to the ethics question because. The, the debate around the use of drones and the perception of them, I think it's been sort of re-energized in this, in this past sort of week with the Kabul strike. So what is the discussion around the ethics of it like? Because we still have this idea kind of from Gulf War I that we can fly a missile through a window, which still isn't true. So what are the ethics around the use of it, especially going into the Biden administration and this question of collateral damage, I guess, especially in the wake of the events of last week. Yeah, so th there's there's kind of two sides to this, which is which is one is the kind of technological side, and and exactly as you you quite rightly mentioned here, you know, dating back to the first Gulf War, this idea of precision warfare, right? The precision ethos, an absolutely core part of modern American warfare, that they wage war in a precise manner, and that that makes it clinical and as clean as war can be, and that is very much up for debate. Um, but you you will see the language definitely, right? That, that idea of precision is used all of the time. The other aspect of this is the uh, legal aspect of, of whether this is ethical or just um, or, or or even acceptable. So if I, if I start with that kind of legal side, because that's probably the slipperiest one. Um, and it's tied in with just the very nature of the war on terror. So what happens when you're talking about the legal side of this is you absolutely need to differentiate between strikes that take place in somewhere like Afghanistan when you are at war in that country. And that was, you know, Article 5 of the NATO Charter. Um, the US Congress authorized that war. The United Nations authorized that war. That's a war zone. And so strikes that take place there are taking place or were taking place. Um, you know, until the end of, of August, um, under the laws of war. Now, under the laws of war, you are meant to do all you can to minimize or prevent civilian casualties. But in a war, civilians can die. It's not illegal to kill civilians in a war, as long as you can demonstrate that you have done absolutely everything you can to minimize the chances of it happening. Um, now, taking a strike in Kabul clearly is in breach of that, right? Like that, that you have not done all you can to minimize civilian casualties because that is a built up urban area. Um, but strikes that took place throughout the Afghan war against um, you know, suspected or known Taliban in, in compounds all across Afghanistan, um, those were legal strikes under the laws of war. Where it becomes much messier is when you then have drone strikes taking place in say um, Yemen like the strike that killed Amar al um, where the United States is not at war in Yemen and there is no um, uh, kind of broad legal reasoning for why you can go and, and do that. Now, the US has constructed its own legal architecture to do that. Um, and whether or not you believe this is legal and ethical depends upon whether you support that idea. So the United States has two things that it uses. Um, the first one is a ruling called unable or unwilling, which loosely draws back on a, a UN Security Council resolution from the early 90s, which um, essentially says if a state is unable or unwilling to stop terrorists within its borders from plotting, then another nation can go over those borders and do something about it. And this, this went back from... Um, uh, this was to do with Sudan at the time and the fact that there were terrorist elements in Sudan. The government of Sudan was doing nothing to stop them. Um, it was kind of safe haven for, for terrorists. Individuals like Carlos the Jackal uh, and so on were, were kind of known to, you know, this is where they would go to. Um, and there had been an assassination plot against Hosni Mubarak. And the UN was responding to that and saying, nations don't have to just sit back and allow this sort of thing to happen. And the US has essentially taken that and supercharged it. 
to say, okay, well, when we combine that with drones, when we combine that with the ability to remotely send aircraft 2,000 miles away, then if, for example, the Assad regime is unable or unwilling to stop ISIS, then they will go over those borders and they will bomb in Syria. If the Yemeni government is unable to stop Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, then they they hold the legal right to go over those borders. Now that, as a as a legal norm, is in the process of being established. There are a handful of countries that agree with it. Uh, the UK does, unsurprisingly, perhaps France does, um, Israel does, um, and there are a handful of countries that uh, oppose it, um, like Syria, for example. And then there are other countries that see that this could be quite interesting. So um, Russia, um, we could see the erosion of legal norms about borders perhaps being applied in terms of Russia's annexation of the Crimea, that the United States has kind of been saying, well, look, you can go over borders and you don't have to go to war. You can just kind of dissolve borders and move over them if you want. So countries like Russia and China um, are, are kind of, on neither side of this. They've, they've sat back and they've watched the United States erode traditional norms about the use of force for their own expediency and, and use of, of kind of counterterrorism. But they have seen that there could be major geostrategical geostrate advantages to this. So the Crimea would be one, Taiwan would be another in the case of China. Then the second part of that is, okay, well, so you're unable and unwilling to go over the border. That might be a one-off strike. What about then if you take somewhere like Somalia, where the US puts um, Navy SEALs on the ground, where it uses airstrikes, where it uses drones, where it also uses F-16s. Well, that's a second legal creation called an area of active hostilities, which essentially means that they can choose a part of the map and they can declare it for a set period of time as an area of active hostilities. And within that, the laws of war exist. So once, so Somalia, for example, as soon as Trump came in, Somalia was declared an area of active hostilities, and we see drone strikes increase dramatically over a month in that area. Um, and civilians in that area now are living within a war zone. So, so their risks and the fact that they could die, um, it, it's not illegal if it happens, but as long as the US is doing all it can to be precise. There is no legal precedent for an area of active hostilities. It is a political creation. And it, it, you know, it's classic Obama administration um, in that he is a legal scholar and you know, he surrounded himself with very capable legal scholars and that they came up with a, a legal definition um, to, their, to their problem here. Um, so you have, a, you have a, you know, an erosion of existing legal norms with um, unable or unwilling and you have a new creation with um, areas of active hostilities. And those two essentially allow you to, to go and wage drone warfare any way you want. The second part of that ethics question, then the part about technology is in order to do that and say, we're doing this right, you have to say, but it's totally precise. And yes, it might be a war zone, but we are doing everything we can to spare civilians from violence. And for that, the US would point towards the, the intelligence. So, you know, these, these counterterrorism pursuit teams, okay, the most famous ones are the ones on the Afghan-Pakistan border, but doubtless they have informants in, in Yemeni um, uh, tribes, they have them in Somalia, they, you know, the CIA is an intelligence agency and it will have assets on the ground. The NSA has enormous authorizations to, to gather and intercept intelligence to feed into these strikes. Um, the drones themselves are gathering um, footage and, and building that up to authorize these strikes. And then you have the precision munitions. So those have evolved, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the first one is a Hellfire missile taken from helicopters, Apache helicopters, and then bolted onto the wing. Over time, new munitions are created. Um, thermo, thermobaric munitions that um, kill by turning the, uh, air in the immediate vicinity to fire. So essentially scorching out the target's lungs. The advantage of that is it's not as much of a percussive blast. So it doesn't necessarily collapse a whole compound. You can destroy an individual room and kill everybody in that room. And in theory, leave the people in the building next door unharmed. And this has come right up to the point where there is now a weapon called the switchblade or, or nicknamed the switchblade, which essentially has knives instead of an explosive. And footage has emerged of drone strikes in um, uh, Syria, where 
the driver's side, the driver's side of a car has been sliced open, but the car has not exploded. And I mean, this is getting right into the realms of, of, of an assassination, right? Like is the, the, the line between an airstrike and an assassination is getting finer and finer and finer. You know, keeping in mind an airstrike is legal in a war, assassination for the CIA at least is not legal. But that precision is part of this ethos. This is legal, this is clean. But the ultimate paradox of this is that the more precise the intelligence and the weaponry has got, the more it has emboldened the United States to take strikes in areas where traditionally you wouldn't be able to do it because it is urban, it is surrounded by civilians, it is near to mosques or schools. Um, and so the precision ethos is completely paradoxical. In theory, precision makes civilians safer, but precision is bringing violence ever closer to civilians. And so how you fall, which side of this you, you're on, really comes down to the extent to which you trust that intelligence agency and the, the, the US government and those responsible to take all available care. Um, and you know, the first strike in which we saw the switchblade used did seem to fit this idea of all available care. But it still raises questions about why the strike occurred the way it did in, in Kabul. Um, and essentially what that shows us is no amount of precision can save civilians if lethal force is applied in the wrong place. Um, and so the, the, the precision ethos alone isn't enough. Um, you know, it, ha it has to be part of this much wider idea of restraint and holding back from is a drone strike, is the application of lethal force really the necessary and the only possible solution to, to this problem? Um, and more times than not, the answer is probably that there is an alternative, but currently it's so seductive um, and it, it seems so expedient that it's difficult for presidents to, to break out of this cycle. We've talked, for example, about Russia and China. We've talked about the, the, the debate about the ethics and the impact of flying drones for pilots. What is the sense about what the future holds for drone warfare? Do you think that drone warfare potentially becomes the norm that you see a phasing out of conventional piloted aircraft in the, in the way that we know it, you know, your modern day typhoons and so on. And, you know, the US cannot be the only nation that is has developed this technology. There must be equivalents in Russia and China. And so, you know, as you say, that there's less of a sense of what Russia and China are, are using this technology for. So can you kind of give us, a, I know it's very difficult to make predictions, but give us a sense of where things might go. Yeah, so so in, in the near term, the, probably one of the most, the most obvious things we'll see with this, um, so ignoring new kinds of technology and where it might go, just with the existing technology, um, the big thing that's kind of occurring and is going to continue to occur is proliferation. So the United States was very careful. Um, you know, dr drone warfare isn't as easy as it looks for, for reasons I, I kind of mentioned earlier about the infrastructure, right? You need um, good satellite connectivity, you need ground control stations, you need intel on the ground as well. It's not easy to just, you know, have drones and fly them around and, and blow things up. There's a network that goes to it, but um, that has been spreading. So the US was very careful about who it shared drone technology with, um, even in the case of a an ally like um, Turkey. It only sold certain versions of drones, it leased certain technology, but um, it didn't give the same sort of access that, say, um, it gave to the British government, um, whose pilots could go and they would train at Creech Air Force Base and they would train right alongside uh, America's kind of elite pilots and, and weapons operators. And, um, you know, they, they were very much a part of that network, um, sharing satellite connectivity, sharing the same aircraft. That wasn't the case, they were, they were quite strict. However, um, drones crashed quite a lot, especially in the earlier days. It's one of the nice things that came through from those Afghan and Iraq war logs that fairly regularly, they would have to send out these recovery elements to go try to find a drone that had lost connectivity and flown into a mountain somewhere in the, the Hindu Kush. Sometimes they got it. Sometimes these things had already been intercepted and sold. And they're sold to Russians, they're sold to Turks, they're sold to the Chinese, and then they're reverse engineered. 
Um, you know, the Iranians got pretty good at this as well. They hacked an American surveillance drone um, and then displayed it fully intact. And similarly, reverse engineered this technology. Now, China is not as strict with providing this technology. So, you know, if you look up China's drone technology, it looks identical to the American Reaper because it, it is. Um, but they sell it to many more countries than the United States is willing to do. Um, and the United States has taught the world how to conduct drone warfare and other nations have paid attention to this. So Turkey, for example, conducts lethal drone strikes um, on its borders. Um, China has this sort of technology. Um, Russia does, Iran does. Uh, Israel was already well advanced with this technology anyway. They've had their own um, uh, drone industry. The, the thing is they have a certain use. So, you know, China couldn't fly drones over Taiwan, for example. Um, they would be easily shot down. Um, you couldn't see Russian drones attacking US targets because they're pretty slow. They're pretty cumbersome. There's a lag between the pilot and the, um, the only, only small two or three seconds. But, you know, if, if you were entering into a dogfight with a, a manned aircraft, um, they're, they're useless in that sense. So they're for a certain kind of thing, right? They're for asymmetric warfare where you want an advantage over the opponent on the ground and it's for kind of a targeted killing style. Um, so that has proliferated and it will continue to proliferate. And, you know, I suspect somewhere like China, over time, if you see more rebellions from uh, Uyghur people, for example, doubtless there would be drone strikes conducted um, that we may well not know anything about or information might come out about them or so on, but you know, that's their kind of use uh, and their role. Um, the next big thing next to this proliferation, which, which now the only way to stop that would be eventually what we need is international laws on this. We need uh, controls, export controls. We need treaties like we saw with um, other kinds of weapons. Um, the next big thing is um, the role between artificial intelligence and drones. So, you know, would we ever see piloted aircraft replaced? Well, you would, you would need much, much better AI than we have now. I mean, it just so happens that this is what the Pentagon and China are pouring enormous sums of money into. They kind of feel that this is probably the next stage, the next um, uh, you know, revolution in military affairs. Um, but it's nowhere near that yet. And that brings up these enormous ethical issues about if you were going to have AI piloting an aircraft, the only advantage of having AI over a human is that it's faster. And in order for that speed to mean anything, um, you, it has to be authorized to kill. And so far, that is, you know, a Rubicon. That is a line that we haven't crossed. The Pentagon has made clear in its AI developments that humans will remain in the loop. It will not authorize AI to, to kill. We can be less sure about what the Chinese government feels on this because they're not as transparent in what they publish about their, their use of it. But, you know, in order for a plane to be able to be remotely piloted and not to have it, well, not remotely piloted, to be automated, a, a true drone, um, yeah, you need to have AI that's authorized to, to make those sorts of decisions. Much more likely in the uh, nearer term is AI used to fly drone swarms. So loads and loads and loads of tiny drones. Um, Pentagon's already released these. You can see footage of F-16s dropping hundreds of drones from bomb pods and then those drones swarming around set targets in, in certain patterns controlled by AI. Um, or even, you know, if you watch uh, Lady Gaga's Super Bowl performance, you'll see drones in the sky writing letters, right? The same thing, micro drones controlled by AI. Um, there's all sorts of possibility for those in terms of lethal uses. Um, and, and that's a technology that's, that's simple and, and kind of already exists. But again, it'll really come down to legal architecture, what we're willing to tolerate, what we want governments to do, um, and it's very much going to be up to the big institutions. It's going to be up to the UN. It's going to be up to the major powers to decide 
whether these things offer military advantage, in which case they'll pursue them, or whether ultimately it seems to be some sort of mutually assured destruction type scenario, in which case we would see treaties and, and controls, uh, export controls and, and rules over their use. Um, certainly for me, my, my preference is very much on that kind of legal control side. You know, the US has ridden fast and loose with international laws because it has suited them for the last 20 years. But now we're at the stage of significant proliferation and big investment in AI. Um, it, you know, we're at a stage now where the military advantage is starting to disappear. And so hopefully, you know, states like the US will start to take the lead in trying to regulate the use of this technology rather than prioritizing its exploitation. Chris, this has been fascinating, sobering, um, thought, it's so, so many things, thought provoking. Um, it's given us a lot to think about, I think, but also perhaps some hope for the future in terms of what you say about the scope for um, greater legal control um, on these, but 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 also you know there's there's heart to be taken from you know the limitations that you discussed here with with this technology. Um, I, I know that folks have found this every bit as engaging as I have. So see it, shoot it. The secret history of the CIA's lethal drone program is available. It's been out for a while now. Folks can get it from the History Hack bookstore. And you're also on Twitter, aren't you, for folks who want to follow your, your latest work and thoughts? Uh, I am, yes, although uh, an infrequent poster. But uh, uh, yes, at, at Dr Chris Fuller on Twitter. So there we go, folks. The History Hack bookstore and on Twitter. Chris, thank you ever so much for this. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. Hello, folks. Zach again here. As you know, we love bringing you these podcasts but each episode has a huge investment of time behind it. For every hour of showtime, there's often a good four or five or six hours of work that's going in behind the scenes. We want to bring you more content, video content even, but as reality has hit and the need to earn a living has returned, we just haven't been able to do that. That's where you come in. Your support doesn't need to be financial. You can follow us on Twitter at hack underscore history. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. Subscribe on YouTube. Even simple likes, shares and retweets make a huge difference in widening our reach beyond the small army of you who tune in. And if you love the show, leave a review. If all our listeners were able to find the two minutes to do that, it would massively increase our reach. Of course, we totally get that times are hard and money is tight. If you can spare something and want to, there are different ways that you can help. If you want to become a regular supporter, check out patreon.com forward slash history hack. There are all kinds of perks across different levels of support with prices starting at £3 a month. If you just want to send us a one-off tip, then visit co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description to this episode. But importantly, also have a think about supporting our listeners. The hour they spend with us is a minuscule fraction of the time that they spend researching and writing their books. With that in mind, we set up the History Hack bookstore, where you can support both them and us instead of funding Jeff Bezos' next trip into space, which is what pretty much happens when you buy via Amazon. Again, the link is in the description, and we have a huge back catalogue of titles written by our guests. When you buy via uk.bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash History Hack, we get a percentage, and so do independent booksellers. Whatever form your support takes, we massively appreciate it. So from Alex, Boney and me, and the rest of your down-the-pub regulars, thank you, and have a great day.